Okay, we're back from our break. Um, I have this picture of a Viking chess man because what I, I wanted to raise the suggestion that William Rufus was kind of a throwback to his Viking ancestors, <laughs> that he was um, he was operating under the kinds of rules we saw in Normandy at the time of Erlewine, uh, where where it was clear that the country was still run by the Danes. I mean, that, that according to the life of Erlewine, he said that at that time the country was run by the old Danes and that William Rufus was still operating a kind of, uh, according to those old traditions. And so he was feeling like he didn't have to make concessions to the church, which is what we were talking about um, as we went on the break. Uh, the question about whether or not the church was important. And he was rejecting the ideas of his father that the church was a very important institution to run the land and that he, he wanted to reign in his own right without any interference from the church. So that's the way I see William Rufus. And I, I think there's just a lot more to do about William Rufus. Well, let's turn to the brother of Robert Curthose and William Rufus. And the surviving brother now is King Henry I, who ruled from 1100 to 1135. And we're going to spend most of our time on Henry I, and we'll touch the anarchy of Stephen's reign. Whoops, I've got a typo there. That semicolon shouldn't be there. And um, we'll, we'll look at the anarchy of Stephen's reign from 1135 to 1154. And Stephen is usually regarded as the last Norman king. Uh, after Stephen are the Angevin kings who are descended from the Normans, but because they, they descend from the male line from the Counts of Anjou, they're given the different name of Angevins. And, and so according to tradition, the Norman period is over with. I, I don't necessarily agree with that, but uh, that's the traditional way of looking at it. We're going to spend more time on King Henry, first of all, because you all read a book about King Henry I by C. Warren Hollister. And this is King Henry I. And this shows, this is a picture of Henry that's on the cover that is, uh, this is of him grieving when his oldest son died, his only son his only legitimate son, I should say. His only legitimate son died, and this is of him being terribly grieved by that. And it's a very famous painting of Henry I here. Maybe I'll zoom in on it a little bit. And it would help to focus. Yes, there we go. So we can see this, this painting of Henry I, and let's zoom out. And maybe focus again. There. Okay. So we had a large book to read on Henry the First. I only had you read about half of it because uh, I thought that would be enough for you to get started on Henry the First. But let's look at his reign from 1100 to 1135. When William Rufus died, and here is Henry the First on his seal. This is his seal. And Ru William Rufus had shown himself as a warrior on his seal. Remember, William the Conqueror showed himself as both a warrior and as a ruling king with a sword and with a, a scepter, the globe of the earth in his hands. And William Rufus showed himself as a warrior, and Henry I showed himself as a, as a seated king on the throne. Okay, this is Henry... Rex Anglorum, King of the English. Henry I was called by the chroniclers the Lion of Justice, the Guardian of the Peace, and in fact, there are uniform praises of Henry I in all the chroniclers. Everybody loved him, and of course, the chroniclers were all churchmen, and the church loved him. They thought he was wonderful. Uh, Hollister calls him a Renaissance prince. Um, I wonder if you found that persuasive in his argument. Did anybody read that part where he called himself a Renaissance prince? Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> it's a big, thick book. Okay, uh, he was called from the beginning Henry Beauclerc because he was educated, and he was educated in England. And so this makes us think right away, uh, uh, what about the level of education at this time? And I've suggested before when we talked about the Abbey of Beck that laymen were educated at Beck and that some of those laymen who were educated at Beck were some of the chief officers in William the Conqueror's government. Um, I don't know if William Rufus was educated or not. We know Henry was, and we know that um, some of the barons at his court were educated. Robert of Moulin, I think, was his chief advisor. Robert of Moulin, and, and I'll need to write his name down for you. I should have done it earlier. Moulin is where he was the count, and his name was Robert of Beaumont originally. And uh, Robert was the, uh, he fought in the Battle of Hastings at the age of 16, and then he was the chief advisor to William Rufus at about the time that William Rufus took over Normandy in 1096. And then he became the chief advisor to Henry I. Uh, Robert of Beaumont, I think, was educated. Uh, Henry I kept a school for children. He raised a lot of the sons of his magnates at his court, and they were all very highly educated. They were given excellent educations, even though they were destined to be um, courtiers and bureaucrats rather than, than, than being uh, churchmen. Yeah. Was this a custom of Norman lords already that they had... Uh children raised at their courts or was education one of the functions no. or just ra military function um, usually young boys at the age of five would be taught the military life and then by the time they were 16 they would be knighted so they would have learned their military skills and they would have learned them in a group but there's no custom until Henry I started it that the king would actually raise a lot of those children at his court. And clearly he did. But Henry did a lot of really new things in England that were different. Um, it's clear from my studies of the Norman lords that, for example, I've done a study of Robert of Beaumont, and as a young boy, he and his brother um, Henry were uh, were raised by their father and taught to do the um, the, the things that, a, that an aristocrat does. In fact, the two children were taken with their father and they witnessed a lot of charters when they were only like six and seven years old. And so the father took them on, on all of his um, uh, legal and administrative duties and taught the sons right with him. And so that appears to me, and that's exactly the way William the Conqueror educated Robert Curthose as well, that he accompanied his father and William Rufus. But Henry was a different case. Now, was it because he was born in England, or was it because he was much younger and was destined for the church? Uh, we don't know. Certainly when he grew up, he didn't go into the church, and he didn't ever plan to go into the church, even though he was educated. Uh, his father gave him money for him to go and make his own way and, and, and um, make whatever fame and fortune he could, and he ended up being king of England. He grabbed the throne when William Rufus died, uh, and he dashed to Winchester to secure the treasury, and of course uh, that was important. The treasury was kept at Winchester at that time, and it was important for him to get the money that was the basis of the kingdom. And then he was crowned an anointed king. And remember the anointing ceremony is very, very important, that when you're anointed king, you take on a, the king takes on a priestly role, almost like a priest. It's the ceremony of the priest. And so he was, he was crowned by the Archbishop of York because, of course, Canter, Canterbury, who was Anselm, was out of the country at that time. But, but Henry immediately wrote a letter to Anselm and said, please come back. We need you. We need you to be Archbishop of Canterbury. And I promise to make right all the things that William Rufus would not do for you. 
Uh, and so on those term an terms, Anselm returned to England, but while he had been at the papal court, some new issues had arisen. And when he came back to England, he said to Henry, I will not do homage to you as I did to William Rufus, because while I was in, in, in Rome, I was at the court of uh, Pope Urban, and I heard with my own ears, and I saw with my own eyes, the Pope forbid churchmen to do homage to laymen, and forbid laymen to give investitures to churchmen. And so when he came back to England, he was ready to impose these laws that, that the Pope had, had um, issued. And of course, Henry would not do that. I mean, for him to give up homage of anybody, uh, of his churchmen, uh, that would ruin the feudal system. Because before that, all the churchmen had done homage to the king. And if they didn't do homage, then he wouldn't control their, their, their fiefs, and he wouldn't control their loyalties. And so it would destroy the feudal system, which is exactly what the popes had in mind when they passed that law. The other provision was that churchmen were not to be invested by laymen. And investing is handing over the, um, the insignia of office or the symbols of office. And it might be the pastoral staff to a bishop or an abbot. It, it, it might be the pallium, which was a kind of stole that you put on your shoulders. Remember, Anselm made such an issue of taking the pallium off the altar of Canterbury as if from the hand of St. Peter. Because if William Rufus had the right to confer it, it would mean he would be conferring that church office. So Anselm agreed with that position. He really agreed with it. And so, but he went home to England and he said, now look, Henry, I was told by the Pope that this is the way it has to be. Henry then said, no way <laughs> that I will give these up. And so Anselm's response was to say, I will speak to the Pope on your behalf and try to see that the customs of England are followed. And this is exactly the argument that Anselm made to Pope Paschal, who was the new Pope. The new Pope was Pope Paschal the second. And he appealed in letters to Pope Paschal to allow England to follow its customary practices, to follow the customs of England, which are the laws of England. Pope Paschal repeatedly replied, no. So here is, is William Rufus, William the Red, who then um, died in 1100. Uh, meanwhile, the king designate of France was Louis the Sixth. The Fat came to Henry's court, and Louis the Sixth was in a lot of danger because his father was Philip the Second of France, and Philip the Second had married as well, not really as his third wife. Bertrada de Montfort was this notorious woman. Who, um, who had left her husband. Uh, she was married to Fulk of Anjou, and she deserted him and ran away with the king of France, who also put aside his wife. And so the church was trying to get them to break up that marriage because they said it was an illegal marriage that they had to be divorced. Bertrada de Montfort married the king of France. She was a real social climber. She reminds me a lot of Mabel of Belém. Uh, and she was that type of Norman woman. And she um, was married to Philip II. She had several sons by him. And she was plotting to kill Louis VI and to get rid of him so that her sons would inherit and become king of France. Because Louis VI had already been declared the king designate as the oldest son of the king of France. So Henry I welcomed Henry the, uh, Louis VI and gave him shelter at his court and protected him from the machinations of Bertrada de Montfort. Uh, and so this was the beginning of a rivalry and friendship between Henry and Louis that's very interesting in the way that it goes back and forth. At the same time that Henry was setting up his court in England, um, 
Robert Curthouse returned with Sybil of Conversano, and in 1102, William Clito was born, and so now Robert Curthouse had an heir. And Robert Curthouse immediately claimed England because he was the oldest son, and remember that he had supporters among the Normans, and uh, it was mostly the English who uh, supported Henry I, and uh, most of the barons uh, supported uh, Robert Curthouse. And Robert Curthouse gathered an army together in 1101 and invaded England. Meanwhile, Henry uh, made sure that he defended his frontiers, and Henry was a very shrewd and clever uh, king. He was a very intelligent man. The first thing he did was make a treaty in 1101 with Robert Count of Flanders, and it, he almost, it, it's almost as if he hired Robert Count of Flanders as, as a protector of the frontiers. And Remember where Flanders is, right across the English Channel, very the closest place to um, England. And uh, in this treaty, Robert Curto, um, um, Henry I uh, agreed to pay him something like 500 pounds a year if he would keep a standing army to guard the English shore. It was a very shrewd uh, treaty. Meanwhile, Anselm rallied the troops on Henry's behalf. and. Anselm actually camped with his soldiers in the field, and he um, uh, persuaded uh, all of the magnates. He sort of spoke to them and harangued them and had them support Henry I instead of going over to the side of the invading army of Robert Curthouse, and all the bishops in England supported Henry I. Anselm, and, and so Henry and Anselm together uh, made peace with Robert Curthouse and kept him from invading England. Anselm then wrote to Pope Paschal II pleading Henry's case and helped Henry marry Edith Matilda, who was the young daughter of Malga, Malcolm and Margaret of Scotland. If you recall that I had mentioned that I think um, William Rufus tried to marry her or to see if she was available. And remember that the abbess popped a veil on her head and said, no, she's a nun. Well, this came back to haunt everybody after Rufus was dead. And she was clearly the obvious ideal person for uh, the king of England to marry. And, and I have a genealogy. By the way, I have put all these genealogies on the website for you because they're a little hard to read on, on TV. Okay, here is the genealogy of Queen Edith Matilda of England. And so you can see, uh, if you can read it at all, it's pretty hard to read because the type is so small. Is that pretty clear? Okay. Here she is, Edith Matilda. Now remember her mother's name, uh, or Henry's mother's name was Matilda. The queens of England are called Matilda. So I call the mother, the, the, the wife of, of uh, William, uh, William the Conqueror, uh, Matilda Flanders. This Matilda I usually call Edith Matilda because Edith was her English name. And, and that is, Edith is the same as Alfgafu. Remember that all the Anglo-Saxon queens were called Alfgafu, and Edith is another rendering of Alfgafu. So Edith Matilda, when she became a Norman queen, she took the name of Edith Matilda. And so she is descended through her line. This is her mother, Margaret of Scotland, who was married to Malcolm, King of Scotland. Then up here, she is descended from Edmund Ironside and um, Ethelred II, if you can see Ethelred II. So that's, she's of the old Anglo-Saxon line, and then here she married Henry I, and, he, and he's related to William Rufus, Robert Curthouse, and these are their children. So this is on the website so that you can see this, this genealogy. Um, so she was the perfect wife. She united the old Anglo-Saxon royal line with the new Norman royal line. The only problem was everyone thought she was a nun because she had had a veil popped on her head. She just didn't like her. 
<laughs> well, she she was too young. She was only 13 years old. I think it was because she was too young uh, that they didn't want him to marry to marry her. And and uh, there, there's more to that story. Somebody has to figure out what was going on with that, with that, with William Rufus. But and, and why did William Rufus go away so easily? I mean, it's it it seems to be against out of his character for him to do that. Her father then immediately went to the monastery and ripped her out of it and took her back home to Scotland and said, I don't want my daughter to be a nun and I don't want her to marry William Rufus. And But by the time that Henry married her, her father was dead, her mother was dead, they both died in the same year. She was all alone and it was a perfect marriage for her. She would be Queen of England and she and this was this was a really wonderful marriage. I also think that Malcolm of Scotland would not have wanted Matilda to marry um to Edith Matilda to marry William Rufus because he was still wanted to attack William Rufus and take Northumbria away from him. Um Anselm didn't exactly make it legal, but he set up a court uh, hearing and he asked all the other bishops to investigate and see what they could find and they argued it out and they rather predictably ruled in Henry's favor that she hadn't been a nun and that she could get married and Anselm stepped aside and you know remained holy and, and uncommitted but he everybody knew what the bishops would find because it was such a perfect marriage for Henry. One of the interesting things about the marriage is they only had thanks one of the interesting things about the marriage is they only had um, two children and I think this is very deliberate on the part of Henry. He had one boy and one girl, and then he stopped having children with Edith Matilda. And Warren Hollister used to say it was because Edith Matilda was so holy and so um, uh, religious and, and so devoted that she kissed lepers and that Henry probably said, well, lips that kiss lepers will never kiss mine. <laughs> that, that was his his um, reasoning by looking at it. But on the other hand, Henry had some 23 illegitimate children that we know of. Those are just the ones we found. And um, we used to think there were only 21, but Hollister found two new ones. And, and he used these children. He had all these children, and he used them for political purposes, for marriage alliances with his enemies and he, he just married um, all of these, these girl children he had to a ring of allies that surrounded the Anglo-Norman state. And so he used them for reasons of state. That's why he had all these affairs. But I think that he deliberately only had two children with Matilda because of the civil wars he went through with his brothers and that, that he thought if he had one son who would inherit the kingdom and one daughter who would then he would marry to the most prestigious head of state in England, which he did. He married her off to the emperor of Germany. And uh, that was all he needed. And I think it was deliberate on his part. It's called family planning, yes, and I think Henry did it. The only way he went wrong was his son actually died before before Henry did, and so he, you know, that's why in England now they say they need an heir and a spare. <laughs> and that's what Charles said when he married Princess Diana, and that's what they needed. Well, here is the money of Philip I of France. This is one of his coins. And uh, so he was the king of France at that time. I don't know why I had that there. Well, in 1103, Anselm set out for Rome, and he was helped by Matilda of Tuscany again. Both of the times that Anselm went to Rome, Matilda of Tuscany met him with her army and escorted him through bandit-ridden territories where bandits were, were knew that he was coming and were trying to rob him. And Matilda of Tuscany actually wrote him some letters, and he wrote her letters, and he thanked her for saving him. Uh, then he went to the papal court and he pled Henry's case at court, but Paschal was unyielding. He said, no, I will not recognize the customs of England. These are the rules from now on. No, uh, There will be no homage to laymen and there will be no investing of churchmen by laymen. 
And so uh, Anselm tried his best to argue at the papal court, but when he was leaving and going back to England then, William Worrell West, the uh, messenger that had come with him from England, who was Henry's messenger, said, well, I'm sorry, Anselm, but you can't come back to England under those terms. And so Anselm then entered his second exile. And, and um, Henry really surprised him with that by telling him that on his way home. Uh, then Anselm was in his second exile. He couldn't go back to England. And in 1104, immediately thereafter, Henry made his first invasion of Normandy, and the justification for invading Normandy was that Curthos was a bad ruler, that he allowed the barons to despoil the churches and attack the churches and rob them, and that he didn't, he didn't protect the monasteries and the bishops and the archbishops. And so he launched this kind of propaganda campaign saying that uh, uh, Robert Curthos is not following the good laws of his father and protecting the people in the church. And then he entered into a propaganda duel with Anselm. And he wrote this whole letter. There are just dozens of letters between Anselm and Henry with this propaganda. They're the nicest, sweet, sweetest letters you'd ever want to see. They're so nice to each other. And Henry wrote and said, Oh, Anselm, I just, please come back to England. I want you so much in the kingdom. The church is just languishing without your protection. We need you here to come back and be Archbishop of Canterbury. The, er the church is orphaned and being despoiled. Um, <laughs> Uh, Henry desired Anselm to come back and be like Lanfranc was with William. Let's rule the church together as co-rulers. <coughs> here is Matilda of Tuscany here on the right, and this is her. This is another um, uh, of the rulers of Tuscany, and here is another portrait of Matilda of Tuscany. And here is the area where Tuscany is as Anselm traveled from England to Rome going through Tuscany. Anselm then wrote to Henry and said, oh, I long to return to protect the church, but I can't possibly set a bad precedent for my successors. I cannot be with you as Lanfranc was with William because now there's a, a new rule in Rome and I cannot disobey the Pope. Uh, the, the Pope had altered the old customs and Anselm could not set customs that were against the papacy. Henry was listening to evil counselors. He was not listening to his own good sense, nor to his wife, who was a very good counselor. He wrote a lot of letters to Queen Matilda and said to the queen that it's her duty to counsel the king rightly on the right path and that she is a mother hen to watch over the church. So she is to take care of the church while Anselm is out of the country. And I mentioned to you last time that Anselm seems to have had this idea that the king and the queen and the archbishop together are equals, ruling the kingdom of England as three equal parties, a kind of troika uh, of, of three equal people. Uh, Anselm then uh, asked the Pope to please excommunicate Henry uh, because he was, he was not obeying the papal laws, but because it was a custom that the Pope had to give three warnings and Henry was speedily conquering Normandy, it was almost too late. So, so Anselm then threatened to excommunicate Henry himself, but he did it in a very shrewd way. He was in Burgundy at that moment, and here we can see where Burgundy is. He was spending his exile in Burgundy with, um, uh, with friends there, reforming friends. And so he wrote a letter to Henry t and said, I'm going to Normandy to excommunicate you because you are b a bad king. Okay. <laughs> Why didn't he just excommunicate him from Burgundy? 
No, it was a kind of feeler. It was a threat to see what would happen. And there was a response. The, the immediate re response among Henry's followers were that they deserted Henry's army in the middle of his, his conquest of Normandy, especially Elias of Maine, who was a very powerful ally. And now it was getting to be 1105, and Anselm then, at that point, went to Blois at the request of Adela, who was the sister of Henry I. Remember I told you that, that we would talk about Adela. Uh, she was a sister of Henry I, and she was the most important of the women children. She had married Stephen of Blois. And Stephen had gone on crusade. He was one of the most famous crusaders who had gone on crusade. Um, he, and, and the battles of the, of, the, of the crusade were just brutal and vicious. They were just horrible. They suffered. Uh, and, and most of the battles in, in Europe, in Normandy, were very brief and swift battles where very few people got killed. And most people were taken, um, were taken um, uh, prisoner and held for ransom. That wasn't, in, wasn't true in the Crusades. The Muslims really killed them. And so Stephen was so traumatized, he deserted and he went home. And Adela just ripped him up and said, you've, you've disgraced me. How can you do this? You've deserted the Crusade. You have to go back. And he said, but I'll be killed. And you, she said, you have to go back. So he went. And, um, uh, and she's supposed to have made these pleas in the marriage bed. And so um, uh, everybody always wondered how Orderic Vitalis knew what she was saying to her husband in their marriage bed, but this is the <laughs> this is the the story. And so he went back to the Holy Land and sure enough he was killed. <laughs> which which then left Adela a very wealthy widow. And she was very powerful. She controlled three counties in the north of France. She controlled Bois, uh, Champagne, and uh, Chartres, three very large counties. All three of them she controlled, and she loved ruling and power so much that um, she wouldn't let her sons inherit. Uh, she just kept control, and they grew up, and they became of age, and they were 35 years old, and she wouldn't give them their inheritance. And so finally, they packed her off to a nunnery when she was about 50 years old. They couldn't get rid of her any other way, so they could have their counties. And so she was very powerful. And so when Anselm, when, when, when she heard that Anselm was threatening to excommunicate her brother, she sent Anselm a message and she said, oh Anselm, I'm so sick and I'm afraid I'm going to die. Please come and counsel me. And so he knew what she was doing. He knew that this was a reason to go see and talk about Henry. And so she went to, um, they all met at Legla which was uh, a castle uh, in southern Normandy. And uh, sh they went there and hammered out a solution. And Henry and Anselm together made a deal. OK, Henry said, I will give up the homage of, uh, I, I will give up the investiture of the churchmen if the pope will give up his demand that I give up homage. In other words, Henry would keep the homage of churchmen, but he would give up investing them with their office, which was a very sensible compromise. And he and Anselm worked it out together. And you can tell this when you read their letters, that the letters, uh, to, they, they then, Anselm wrote a letter to Pope Paschal and said, we propose this arrangement, but we can only do it if it meets your approval. It is not my place to make this compromise, but it is yours. Is, is this what you want to do? And so he put it all in Pascal's hands. And then Pascal wrote back and did approve it. But it was Anselm and Henry who came to the, to the compromise. Yeah. Is investiture something of a theological thing is at this time, or is it just a political situation that they are trying to trade well well it's both because when you when you invest someone with a, with a church office you you have the power to choose who you're going to put in that office for one thing and this is what the popes wanted the right to choose who who 
who the bishops and the abbots would be, but also the granting of the control of that office by the symbol of office, whether it's the pastoral staff or whether it's the pallium or whatever symbol, means that the person who confers it has the power to confer it. And the Pope wanted to take that out of the hands of kings and laymen and, and, and put it in the hands of churchmen, usually himself, I mean. And, and so a lot of it was political, but for, for theological reasons. But they saw themselves as having certain amount of sacredness at this time? Yes, they saw it as a sacred handing of a sacred office. Uh, but still, the political component, you can't get around it. And so it's not appropriate, they said, for a layman like a king or a count to confer a sacred office. And, and so, so they're using a religious reason, but it's a political issue. And, and what it does is break the back of feudalism. It destroys feudalism if you do this. And, and eventually that's what happened. And so, but Anselm really argued on the side of the king. He was trying to help, help the king more than the pope in, in the case of Henry I. And he would have cooperated with William Rufus, I think, as well. Well, I mentioned that Anselm was so concerned with his successors. Here is one of Anselm's successors. This is um, this is Saint Edward, who was a, a, an Archbishop of Canterbury a couple hundred years later. And reading the life of Saint Edward, it is just extraordinary how much he reenacted Anselm's career. I mean, he followed exactly the same pattern. And here he is presiding over the Council of London, which Anselm did later on, presided over the Council of London. In 1106, uh, Anselm, at the request of Henry I, agreed to a public reconciliation of the king and the archbishop at Beck. Henry kept begging Anselm to come back to England, come back to England and let everybody know that you have agreed to this compromise. Anselm wouldn't do it he, because uh, he was afraid that Henry would take advantage of him. And not until Henry actually came to Beck and they had a, a, a big public ceremony there uh, um, showing the compromise that they did, did uh, Henry then dare to go on to the battle to conquer Normandy. And right after the ceremony at Beck, he proceeded to Tonchebray, where at the Battle of Tonchebray, he, he defeated Robert Curthose and took him captive and imprisoned him for the rest of his life. And at that moment, Henry took Normandy. But Anselm knew that if he didn't move to get this compromise before Henry took Normandy, he wouldn't have any leverage over the king at all, because once the king had everything he wanted, why should he concede anything to Anselm? And then, right after the Battle of Tonchebray, which I believe was in September, I could be wrong about that, I think it was in the fall though, then they went back to England and in 1107, at the Great Council of London, uh, both Henry and Anselm together appointed new bishops, new bishops to the vacancies in England and in Normandy. And it's important that they appointed them to Normandy as well because it suggests that, that England and Normandy are tied together and that Anselm somehow also had jurisdiction over the Norman churches. And, and that is quite curious. Well, in 1108, King Philip of France died and Louis the Fat inherited. Anselm now began a new struggle with a new Archbishop of York. The old Archbishop of York, who had been Gerald, had died, and there was a new Archbishop called Thomas II. And Thomas II stood firmly for the rights of York and refused to swear obedience to Anselm. And so Anselm fought him tooth and nail and on his deathbed he wrote this fiery letter commanding Thomas of York to do, homage, to do obedience to Canterbury and it was the great disappointment of his life that he didn't succeed in getting the submission of York. Well, meanwhile, in 1108, uh, Henry I arranged the marriage of his daughter, Matilda. Matilda, okay, now this Matilda we call the Empress Matilda. And that is because this Matilda married 
the Emperor Henry V of Germany as a five-year-old child, and she went to Germany where she was raised and educated in Germany, and to grow up <laughs> to finally marry um, Henry V of Germany. And here we see Normandy. Uh, I think I was going to show you Tonchebray, and I probably can't find it now. Um, somewhere around Beck. Well, we, we won't take the time to find it, but um, sorry I didn't mark it for you. Anyway, Henry had Normandy. Here is the seal of Louis the Fat, uh, who then became King of France. And notice uh, how interesting he doesn't hold a sword. He so holds the fleur-de-lis. So he's not a warrior like Henry. And this is uh, one of the, uh, a, a, a fragment of a facsimile of a document signed by Abbot Suger. And this is Abbot Suger's seal. Uh, let me kind of zoom in on that to see the picture of Abbot Suger. Because he was the power behind the throne, he was the churchman who really solidified the kingdom of France into a viable entity uh, that began to rival the Norman kings. He was the intelligence behind building the power of the kings of France, and especially Louis the Fat, and he did it on the model of the Anglo-Norman kings. He was copying them. Yeah, a question. Does Philip Augustus come next? After him? No, no. The, we have Louis the Sixth, uh, Louis the Seventh, and then Philip Augustus. Yeah. Um, oh, here is a coin of the Emperor Henry V, and let's uh, let's kind of zoom in on him to get a picture of what he looked like. This is this is the Emperor Henry the Sixth with his coin of Germany, with his portrait. Okay, and here is uh, the German Empire, which included northern Italy, plus all of this area of Germany. And so you can see what a coup that was to marry Henry's daughter to the Emperor of Germany. That was really quite a, a, a feat. Well, in 1109, Anselm died. His achievements had been to set the standards for the, um, the Anglo-Norman Church. Uh, the investiture con contest was a three-way struggle between the king, pope, and archbishop. And I think Anselm saw himself as pope of another world and as the Canterbury Church as the mother of all Britain. And, and he said that as the archbishop of Canterbury, he was the ruler of all Britain, including England, Scotland, Ireland, and the Orkney Islands. And he saw himself as the kind of pope of another world. Anselm was the most successful of all the archbishops of being a ruler of all Britain because he got the obedience of the bishops of Ireland and Wales. Uh, never Scotland, but he got Ireland and Wales, and even some in the Orkneys. Yeah. Did he do any important writing during these last few years of exile? He did a little, he finished up th some things. Most of his important writing was done at Beck, uh, but he, he finished up some, some, of his, some of his writings during his second exile, or his first exile, excuse me, not during the second one. The idea of the place of women is something that's throughout his writing? It, it, it permeates all of his letters, and, and I had to come to that conclusion through an analysis of his letters. Uh, primarily, but also, also the um, lives of the abbots of Beck and how they treated mothers in their discourse, uh, which which appears in all of those lives of the abbots. Uh, and then there's a life. Remember, I told you he had this wonderful friend. Ida of Boulogne, who was his best friend all his life, and she wrote lots of letters to him. And, and there's a saint's life of her that portrays her in that very same way. And Erwan's mother had a role. Yeah, so, it, so there's some roots at Beck before Anselm got there that he had that image of women. Uh, by the way, I have a, um, a genealogy of Ida of Boulogne here, and she was actually the half-sister of Matilda of Tuscany. Uh, 
Let's see if I can zoom in on it a bit. It's kind of hard to read. Okay, here's Ida of Lorraine and um, okay, well, let's move it over. <laughs> you can't see it. All right. Here's Ida of Lorraine, and she is the half sister of Matilda of Tuscany because Matilda's mother married Ida's father. Okay, and so they're half stepsisters. And, and then the Counts of Boulogne, the Counts of Tuscany, here's the line of the Counts of Tuscany, and here's the line of the Counts of Boulogne, who are, um, uh, not of Boulogne, but of Lorraine, who were very important in the um, Anglo-Norman, um, not Anglo-Norman, but in the German hierarchy, the, the Counts of Lorraine were extremely important and influential in the German Empire. And so uh, uh, they were very important. And, and that's why Anselm, I think, dealt with both of them, because they were related to each other and they helped each other. Okay. I have one more genealogy that, that I'll show you perhaps. Um, well... I'll show it to you a little bit later. Okay. Now let's look at the rest of Henry's reign. And here, here is uh, St. Edward, St. Edmund again as a peacemaker as Anselm had been. Uh, he was the successor of Anselm and he treated Anselm the same way. Uh, immediately after Anselm's death, there was a confrontation between Henry and King Louis at the castle of Gisors. And remember that William Rufus had really built that castle and Henry had fortified it. In 1110, Louis began to support the claims of William Clido as heir to Normandy. Clido was now a boy of 10 and had been raised by Count Elias of St. Seine. Robert of Belem and other border lords and Norman dissidents then joined the Angevins and now joined together as allies and the Angevins were now in control of Maine again and to confront them Henry began to build castles all along the border. And here is the castle of Gisors which is so powerful and strong a castle. And here is where Henry was building his castles all along the border of Normandy because it was those border lords who were rebelling. And let's see if I can find Belem. I think it's here. This is, yeah, this is Belem right here. You can barely read it. Here is Chateau Gaillard, which is uh, typical of the castles that Henry built all along his borders. Now he was building them of stone. In 1113, Henry imprisoned Robert of Belem and confiscated his lands. Remember who Robert was? She was Mabel of Belem's son. He was Mabel of Belem's son. And Henry then made a truce with the Angevins. The Angevins controlled Maine and acknowledged Henry's overlord, or but an acknowledged Henry's overlordship of it. King Louis then sought a truce at the castle of Gisors. Henry's network of allies and kinsmen had built a buffer zone around Normandy, where he built those castles all along the Norman borders. He married off his daughters to the local lords, and that's how he secured them. He made them kinsmen. It makes you think of Eleanor Searle's book, Predatory Kinship and the Creation of Norman Power, that she only takes up to 1066. But here, Henry is carrying the idea of predatory kinship to a really interesting conclusion with all of his illegitimate children. Yeah. I think we should rename European history at this time All in the Family. <laughs> yeah, All in the Family. Well, at least Henry I, All in the Family. Henry's 23 bastard children were then used in these marriage alliances. But what was happening was the Capetians were being marginalized and pressed back into the Parisian domains. And of course, Abbot Suger, who had tried so hard to promote Louis VI kingship, uh, was not happy with that, and neither was King Louis. And so here we see on our map, all along these Norman borders, the strengthening of the Norman borders. And here is um, 
here is the Duchy of Paris. It's just this tiny little area here. Can you see it outlined? This is Paris, and look how huge Normandy and Maine and Brittany is compared to the area of Paris, plus all of these people up here uh, at Boulogne and Flanders are allies of Henry. And this is Anjou to the south of Maine. The, and so the Normans and the Angevins are in this continual struggle over Maine. Well, in 1114, Henry finally filled the vacancy uh, uh, that was left by Anselm's death. <laughs> We criticize William Rufus for leaving the um, archbishopric vacant for four years. Henry left it vacant for five years before he replaced the Archbishop of Canterbury. And there was a huge struggle over the election of who was going to be Archbishop of Canterbury. Um, Henry wanted to make his own physician uh, the, uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury, but the monks won the right to elect their own Archbishop, and they chose Rafe de Skewer who had been uh, the Bishop of Rochester before. And when you read Eadmer on the story of Rafe's um, career, he, again, he reenacted what Anselm did. He even went into exile, but he stood for all the things Anselm did. He made the same arguments that Anselm did, and he even went into exile. But meanwhile, Henry had strengthened the York archbishops, and Thurston of York negotiated with the Pope for his own pallium. He was not going to accept it from Anselm, because that would mean, Ans uh, not Anselm, but the Archbishop of Canterbury, Ralph de Skewer, because that would mean Ralph de Skewer had power over him. So he went to the Pope and received his pallium directly from the Pope as uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Ralph Tuscure, had done, and so then he can consider them both equal. Henry encouraged this, this struggle by the Archbishop of York. He pretended to stand back and not play favorites, but what he did in reality was encourage the struggle because this weakened the Archbishop of Canterbury, and so it strengthened the king's power. In 1118, with the deaths of Queen Edith Matilda and Robert of Moulin, the Queen had embodied the loyalty of the English to Henry. And Queen Edith is a very, Edith Matilda is a very interesting person. Um, there's a new book out on her by Lois Honeycutt, and it's called Matilda of Scotland, A Study in Medieval Queenship. And here is Matilda's seal. Um, Hollister always called Matilda, Matilda, Edith Matilda, and I kind of like to call her that myself because it distinguishes her from both her mother and her daughter and another Queen Matilda that there is. Uh, but uh, Lois likes to call her Matilda II because that's what she called herself on her seal. She called herself Matilda II, and it's hard to read this, but that's what she called herself. So Matilda II she is. This is a wonderful book. She's a very interesting queen of the English. Um, the queen had embodied the loyalty of the English to Henry. She had held a, a splendid court in encouraging literary production. She had her own set of courtiers that mirrored the king. She was a very powerful queen. Their son, William, was known as the Aethling, which is the old Anglo-Saxon term, and he was really known as William Adeline. Which, which was a normalization of the term aethling. The aethling was the Anglo-Saxon term. Here is the Archbishop of uh, Canterbury. Uh, well, here is the, actually, this is the Archbishop of York consecrating St. Edmund as Archbishop of Canterbury. And so you can see how the, how the strength of York has been increased over the years in English tradition. No, it's a, it's a real drawing, a drawing by Matthew Paris that tells the story of, of, of what really happened. And Matthew Paris is a good historian. But it's later, it's after Anselm.
Count Robert had been the king's chief advisor. This is Robert of Moulin again, and Moulin was an invaluable military obstacle to Louis VI. It blocked communication up and down the Seine, and when Robert died, it was a big blow to Henry because it so strengthened Louis once he had access to that castle of Moulin, because remember, Moulin was in the domain of the King of Paris, and as long as Robert had it, it, it helped Henry, but now it was going to be awarded to somebody else. And actually his son, Walleran, got it, but he wasn't as strong as Robert. In that same year, Count William of Evreux also died, and there was a contested inheritance. Amari de Montfort was uh, one of those frontier lords who was loyal to Louis, and many in Normandy joined Amari's rebellion. Suddenly, Louis and William Clito's cause had the advantage, and the, re the rebellious lords were joined by Eustace of Bretoy, who was Henry's own son-in-law. Eustace was married to Henry's daughter, Juliana. And um, then Baldwin VII of Flanders, who was, who was um, Henry's own cousin, joined in the rebellion. The Counts of Amal and Eu were also Henry's cousins who joined in the rebellion. And so at this point, Henry was in the worst place of his whole career. Normandy was under attack from all sides. And so all of these border lords now were attacking Henry around all of his borders. In 1119, Henry bought off Fulk of Anjou with the marriage of Fulk's daughter to his son, William Adeline, and he also agreed to restore the son of Robert of Belem to the Belem lands. The Counts of Flanders, the Count of Flanders was wounded and withdrew and died, and so the rebellion kind of broke down. Henry secured the support of the Bretons and the English knights, and Henry and Louis met at the Battle of Bremoule. Uh, their armies about equal in strength, and Henry won with an encircling tactic. As usual, there were few fatalities, but many were taken captive. And in the retreat, Louis ignominiously lost his standard and his horse. So the King of France was truly humiliated in the Battle of Bremoule. Here is the seal of Henry I now as the great victor in this battle. In 1120, everyone sought peace, and the peace was crowned by a papal settlement. Pope Calixtus II was at Rheims, and he came to Gisors to meet with Henry. Calixtus greeted Henry as a kinsman because both were great grandsons of Duke Richard II of Normandy, and you can track that down on this genealogy, which is a genealogy starting with Rollo and tracing all the relatives of, of um, Rollo and the counts of uh, the counts of Normandy, the Dukes of Normandy, and so as you can see, it's a it's a tremendously complex um, genealogy that we can't go through all here, but it is on the website so you can <coughs> track these relationships down. You can print it out and track them down. The peace, the Calixtus was formerly Archbishop Guy of Vienne, and he was related through a marriage to one of the uh, one of the aunts of William the Conqueror. It was Adelaide, who remember was a sister of uh, Adela of Blois, and he's he's uh, connected through her. Um, Peace between Henry and Louis was ratified by William Adelin doing homage to Louis for Normandy, and William was hailed as Dux et Rex Designatus, and he then married Margaret of Anjou. So William was recognized as the future Duke of Normandy and the King of England, unifying the realms. But in November, the wreck of the white ship occurred. What had happened was all the young people, all the glittering aristocrats of Normandy were celebrating the victory together and the peace, about to cross the channel to go back to England, and they were all drunk, including the entire uh, crew of the ship, and they were racing another ship to get, uh, to get out of the harbor, and they hit a rock. <laughs> 
And so this one ship went down with all the royalty of England, including William Adelin and his half-siblings, Richard and Matilda of Perche, who drowned. Many other partying young people drowned. In fact, there was only one survivor from the whole shipwreck. And so Henry, that was when we had this picture of Henry that's on the cover of uh, the cover of um, Warren Hollister's biography of Henry the um, First, which is this very sad, uh, traumatic event that really changed the course of his whole reign. Henry held the eighthling's wife, Margaret, in England, but Fulk of Anjou demanded her back, and Henry wouldn't give her back. And so Fulk now supported William Clito again. Here is a Norman ship, like the white ship that sunk, uh, killing all of the young aristocrats. In 1121, King Henry, at age 53, remarried. His wife was dead, his son was dead, he had to have an heir. He married a very young woman, Adeliza of Louvain, who came from that area of Lorraine, uh, Brabant, and it's kind of, it's kind of near, um, uh, near Frisia, it's in Frisia. Adeliza had a good understanding of the expected role of queen, but she did not produce an heir. And we know it wasn't her fault because after Henry died, she married again and she did have children, but she didn't have a child by Henry. In 1122, Henry faced a rebellion and then it, it must have made him even more heart sick because everything was going wrong for him. His son died, his queen was not having a child. The Beaumont twins, the son of his most trusted advisor, Robert of Moulin, the twin sons, and Amaury de Montfort joined the, re the rebellion supporting William Clito, and the marriage was arranged between William Clito and the daughter of Fulk of Anjou. And here is the coin of Henry I, and we can see what Henry looks like. In 1124, the Emperor Henry V became involved because he saw himself as the potential heir of England and Normandy in right of his wife, Matilda. Uh, but uh, tragically again, in 1125, the Emperor Henry V died. He died of cancer, you know, something totally uh, unpredictable that happened to him. Now Henry didn't have an heir and he didn't have a strong protector of his daughter, so what does he do? He named his daughter Matilda as his heir. The Empress Matilda he named as his heir. He married her off to Geoffrey of Anjou, who was a teenager. She was about 35 at the time. Geoffrey was in his teens. This was not destined to be a, a terribly good marriage from the beginning. The Norman and the Norman French magnates once again rebelled in favor of William Clito. He also married his nephew Stephen to Matilda of Blois, and Matilda was the, the daughter of, um, uh, okay, wait a minute, I've got this confused. It's not Matilda of Blois, I typed it wrong, Boulogne. Okay, Matilda was the daughter, and, and Matilda's a queen's name, remember. Matilda was the daughter of Eustace of Boulogne and Ida, who had been so important. And so uh, she then was married off to Stephen. So the, the, the and Stephen, of course, was the son of Adela, Henry's sister. Okay, you got all that? <laughs> all these family connections. This is really important to the Normans. Okay, in 1127 then, Henry made the magnates swear oaths of fealty to the empress, but he was dealt a blow because at that moment, William Clido became Count of Flanders, and that made him very important, and that made him very strong, okay? The Empress Matilda uh, didn't have a good chance of marrying. She always called herself the Empress, by the way. Once an Empress, always an Empress. And there's a wonderful book, a biography of her, the Empress Matilda, Queen Consort, Queen Mother, and Lady of the English. And this is Matilda 
as as the Empress. I think this is Matilda, and this is her husband, the Emperor Henry V. Um, and this is by Marjorie Chibnall. And it's a wonderful book that tells her whole story if you want to read more. Um, yeah. You said that at that time she was in her 30s, but she couldn't have been because she was the daughter of Edith Matilda, who didn't marry Henry until uh, some 20 odd years before, so she couldn't have been that old. You're right. I didn't, I can't count that well. <laughs> okay, yeah, thank you for, for, she must have been in her late 20s then, but she was at least 10 years or more older than, um, she was 10 years or more older than um, her husband, Geoffrey of Anjou. Just from the, I mean, it sounds like she was in her early to mid 20s, actually. No, it would, been, would have been more like her late 20s. Yeah. Okay, so the barons and bishops swore a second oath after the death of William Clido. Fortunately for Henry, uh, in 1128, William Clido died, and he died in, in a battle. And, um, and then Henry made the barons and bishops swear a second oath after uh, the death of William Clido. His nephew, David, King of Scots, was raised at Henry's court, and so the David, King of Scots, was also supporting the Empress Matilda. In 1133, Henry, the son of the Empress and Geoffrey of Anjou, was born, and shortly thereafter, a second son, Geoffrey, was born. But they had their troubles, uh, the Empress and, Je and uh, Geoffrey. They had, uh, they had a lot of quarrels, and they didn't get along well. Uh, when Henry I died, they were not at court with him, and his nephew, Count Stephen of Bois, Chartres, and Champagne, jumped on his ship and sailed across the channel and grabbed the, the crown in much the same way that Henry had grabbed it himself. Uh, Stephen got himself crowned king before Matilda even knew that her father was dead, and so he just outsmarted her. He outsmarted her. Um, my graduate student, Jean Truax, has written a dissertation. This was a number of years ago uh, that Jean wrote her dissertation here at the University of Houston on the succession crisis of 1135, and she asked the question, could Matilda have been queen? And she came to the conclusion that um, Matilda could have inherited. The deciding factor here was that um, Stephen grabbed the throne and got the archbishop to consecrate him king. It was the archbishop of Canterbury who consecrated him king. And once he was consecrated, you couldn't displace him because like a priest, he was king for life. And so that's, that was the crucial factor. If she had moved and if she had been consecrated before Stephen moved, she could have been Queen of England. There was nothing to prevent her from being Queen of England in, in the inheritance uh, theory, in the support of the barons. It was purely the consecration that made the difference. So if anybody wants to read that dissertation, it's extremely interesting, but enormously long. It's at least 500 pages. A very brilliant dissertation, though. And so here is England and the Anglo-Norman realm, which uh, Matilda and Stephen then began a civil war over this kingdom. First, before we look at the Civil War, let's look at some of the achievements of Henry I, though, just briefly. He invented a lot of administrative reforms. He really put a true bureaucracy in place. He worked on the, worked on the reforms of William Rufus and extended them. He literally invented the Exchequer, which is the Office of the Treasury, a separate treasury at Winchester. He invented the Office of Justiciar. Which had, which had been sort of a quasi-office before, but he made it a formal office. And the first and powerful justiciar was Roger of Salisbury, who functioned as a kind of viceroy of the king. 
He created a whole new administrative elite, which were called men raised from the dust. Uh, in other words, they owed their wealth and career to Henry, so they were perfectly loyal to him. He, he wrote a collection of laws, not himself, but they were written under his reign, called the Leges Enrici Primi, and it's the first law code that we can call a real Norman law code, uh, written under his own laws. It's a very, it's a very difficult law code. Um, people have looked at it and they can't, they can't see any sense to it or rhyme or reason to it. It seems very arbitrary. Um, uh, and it's not the first Norman law code because we have a new edition of um, the laws of Edward the Confessor that uh, is by Bruce O'Brien that, um, that calls the laws of Edward C the Confessor the first real uh, Norman law code because the Normans wrote those laws down of Edward the Confessor. But the Leges Enrique Primi represent a next step toward the for formation of English common law and they're very important. But that if any graduate students want to do a project, somebody has to explain what they are and nobody has successfully done that yet. Hollister calls Henry I a Renaissance prince, and he was certainly a master of diplomacy with his 23 bastard children and their uses. Robert of Gloucester was the oldest of his illegitimate sons, and Robert of Gloucester was the, uh, was the primary supporter of Henry. He was his right-hand man in, in England, and Henry made him rich and powerful and supported him uh, very well. Uh, Juliana, I've, I've spelled this wrong, it's actually Juliana married Eustace of Boulogne, who I mentioned before. And Robert of Gloucester presented Henry with his first uh, grandchild, who also was a bastard, uh, following his father's footsteps. Yeah. Why not make Robert of Gloucester his heir instead of Matilda? because he was illegitimate. Okay, by then the, the church was able to enforce the laws of marriage on Henry I. They could not enforce it on uh, William the Bastard because the church was not strong enough at that time. Now the church had gotten a lot stronger and the moral temperament of the people was, uh, would forbid that to happen. Well, Henry made huge contributions to the Abbey of Cluny and raised a lot of the children, as we mentioned, a lot of the children of his own magnates at his court, including the Beaumont twins and David of Scotland. But above all, Henry kept the peace for 35 years in England. There were no wars and no invasions in England. There were wars in Normandy, but not in England for 35 years. So he was known as the Prince of Peace, so to speak. This is a view of Leon, which is where a lot of the uh, bureaucrats in Henry's realm, the laymen, were educated at the School of Leon. This is a view of the School of Leon. Here is a view of the church, St. Vincent of Leon, and this is where his, his um, courtiers were educated. Here's the belfry of uh, Leon. Stephen's reign is largely anarchy. What can we say about Stephen's reign? It's very curious that this, this biography of Henry I is the first biography that's ever been written by modern people of Henry I or medieval people. Nobody wrote a history of Henry I's reign. But Stephen's reign has had dozens of writers who write about it. Why? Because there's nothing but warfare to write about. And so, you know, those who love blood and guts and chivalry, they love the warfare. And so Stephen's reign has been written about endlessly. Stephen was the son of the conqueror's daughter Adela and the crusader Stephen of Bois. And here again, I refer you to this genealogy that is on the website, the genealogy of, of Adelaide, sister of William the Conqueror, and Adela of Bois, daughter of William the Conqueror. And so let's see where I can find Adela. Here is Adela down here, who is... Um, 
the daughter of William the Conqueror, and here are all the other, other children. And Adela married Stephen of Bois Champagne. Okay. Um, Stephen became, uh, uh, the marriage took place between 1080 and 1084, and Stephen became the Count of Champagne, Bois, and Chartres in 1093. Stephen the Crusader died in 1102. His mother educated him well. He had a tutor called William the Norman, and Adela was the sponsor of a lot of court. By the way, he became the count, but she kept all the power. I mean, she wouldn't turn it over to him, even though he was the count in name only. His mother educated him well, and she had a, a brilliant court where poets and, and entertainers and, and literary people wrote. Um, Stephen was knighted by King Henry, probably along with David of Scotland at about age 16, and he was made Count of Mortain. Okay, and, and here we can see um, uh, Blois Champagne is right in this area. This is where he, he and, and Leon is in that area where the school of Henry I was, too. He became one of the leaders of the Anglo-Norman court life, and Henry heavily supported his family. In 1125, he married Matilda, the heiress to the county of Boulogne, and the daughter of Count Eustace III. He thus controlled the powerful county of Boulogne, plus huge estates in England, Suffolk, and Essex. And, and so he, he controlled a very rich and powerful collection of fiefs. Stephen and his brother Theobald had already planned to grab the throne as Henry lay dying, and Stephen sailed across the channel and grabbed the treasure and the throne. And let's, let's uh, skip this. He was crowned and anointed with the help of his brother, Henry, Bishop of Winchester in England, and Roger, Bishop of Salisbury, and they were the ones who persuaded the Archbishop of Canterbury to crown him. And this was within a month of Henry's death. Robert of Gloucester submitted, and Baldwin de Redvers Castellan of Exeter, whom Stephen had besieged. Theobald of Beck then became Archbishop of Canterbury. In 1138, David of Scotland invaded on behalf of the Empress, and Robert of Gloucester also invaded on behalf of the Empress. And the Empress was invited to land at Arundel, and let's just skip these, by William of Albany, who was now married to Queen Adeliza. And Stephen gave the Empress free passage to Bristol. In 1139, the council recognized Stephen as king, and Geoffrey of Anjou conquered Normandy and installed his son Henry as the duke. Um, in a brilliant political move, Queen Matilda uh, betrothed, her, this is Queen Matilda, not the Empress Matilda, and we're running out of time. Uh, queen Matilda of Boulogne was a very shrewd and able queen, not like her incompetent husband, uh, Stephen of Bois. The upshot was that Matilda didn't win England, but her son inherited. And so this was the end then of the Anglo-Norman line. Next time, we'll turn to southern Italy and Sicily and see what the Normans were doing there. Okay, have a good spring break. <laughs>